welcome to Heliotropes. My name is Julia. My name is Kojo. And today we're going to be talking about restorative justice and maybe transformative justice and some of the, I suppose, benefits of it and also some of the gaps and holes in the process. So this came about, um, or this conversation between the two of us came about yesterday after watching um, a film called Healing Justice, which is about restorative justice, and it kind of it goes through three segments. It um, discusses um, like the systems and um, the underlying causes of crime in the U.S. and trauma. There's a lot of information in there about trauma, um, and then you know there's some discussions in the film. You get to hear from some folks who have been in. Uh, who have been incarcerated, um, some folks who have gone through the restorative justice process, and then, you know, some people who are running programs, restorative justice programs. I mean, there's tons of statistics. The film's not terribly long, but it is um, an interesting film. And um, it also left us with some questions. So maybe we should start by uh, talking a little bit about what restorative justice is and maybe... Uh, yeah, the difference between that and transformative justice, which I'm still not completely clear on, but have a couple of ideas about. So do you want to no, like start we should with that? Start. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should definitely start with that. Okay. Uh, well, I'll share some of what I know, and then you can share some of what you know. So my understanding of restorative justice is that it is an attempt to... Um, to manage or to understand that everybody involved in the crime that has happened is um, is a victim and and deserves healing in some capacity. And so the idea is that right like if a crime happens, then instead of um, getting involved in like the legal system and the prison system, right it could get diverted to more of a, Kind of community-oriented um, negotiation or mediation, um, understanding that the offender of the crime also requires some sort of healing um, and justice in that process. Now, my understanding of transformative justice is that it is a much broader, I guess, and bolder um, movement and idea in the way of really taking into account all of the systems and the root of crime, right? So the restorative justice piece doesn't necessarily look at the root of crime, like understands the root of it in a, in a way to implement it um, or to use that information to, um, I guess, like to better understand why crime happens and the offender, but not necessarily to shift the larger systems in the country. And transformative justice, I think, looks to um, repair those systems and then hopefully, like, you know, shift everything going forward. But that it's still like a little bit fuzzy. And I'm referring to the gap that we're going to talk a little bit about, um, like what happens, you know, before we get to the restorative justice piece. Um, so it's still a little bit fuzzy to me about how transformative justice would shift that narrative. But what I think would happen is that, like, if it's fixing the systems, then ultimately, like, you know, the police wouldn't exist in that same capacity. Like, it's much more community-oriented. So that's a little bit about restorative justice and transformative justice. I mean, there are programs out there. You can check them out. Um the community programs that are pretty well established and that are doing, you know, some great work to um, decrease or eliminate um, like the, you know, the school to prison pipeline in some places and to um, give, give younger, I mean, younger folks in particular, it seems um, a better chance of, you know, of not being incarcerated for the rest of their lives for some nonviolent menial offense. And so, I, I don't know, do you want to jump into the gap? Like, this this piece around it, and I guess, you know, you can share from your perspective, but one of the things... Okay, so the film really... Or I guess, like, our conversation about this... Hmm. I'm not sure where to start. 
Um, I mean, you know, like I would start with well, I think where you've already started as far as going over everything is solid. It's a good place to start. Um, there's also this question of why is it necessary, right? Like why is restorative justice necessary? Why is transformative justice necessary? Um, and I don't know if this is somewhere that you were going to go, but just thinking about um, from, you know, like what of the documentary that I saw, the different stories, right? There's what happens around the perpetrators of a crime, you know, the people who go to trial and get sent to prison and are, you know, disenfranchised from society for however long. What happens to them? What happens to their family? You know, that's all on one side. And then there's the, um, the victim of the crime or, you know, target or whatever, you know, survivor language you want to use around that. There's that whole side of the equation, right? Like, and, you know, their family and their community and the community of the perpetrator as well. Like, it's not just the people involved, but the entire communities involved or that those people are involved with and what happens to them. And I think it's just you know, uh, important to address this question of why they're necessary in the sense that like a lot of people do think, you know, they're so accustomed to this idea of justice being punishment. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. really important to note that the punitive system would, you know, the system of punishment doesn't just get in the way of justice, um, period right like it's it's in the way of justice for the perpetrator and the victim right people who are sitting in cells behind bars for years are not healing right they're not becoming better people in those places and that really should be the mission of right like if someone does something wrong you don't want them to right the ultimate goal shouldn't be to punish them for what they did wrong because you know, unless you think that that's going to make them do better in the future which you know, like for all intents and purposes, that data isn't out there, right? The data doesn't suggest that that's true. And then on the other hand, it doesn't help the per uh, the people, right? The people, mm -hmm. communities of the victims to just watch someone and not even watch, right? <laughs> you know, because that's how the whole system's designed is to keep people out of sight. But to know that someone is sitting in a cell, you know, somewhere, right? They might feel a little bit safer, in like, you know, some trauma response sense, but that doesn't equate to justice. Doesn't equate to healing yeah. either for that person. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, those are the things I would throw out for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that's obviously like a really important piece, right? And the idea around restorative justice uh, and transformative justice is that it's a communal and a societal problem and that in restorative justice, it's focused on like what the, if we're gonna use like offender and victim, like what the victim of the crime needs to heal in that moment, right? So it's really like centered around that narrative as opposed to, um, you know, just finding out who did something wrong and like throwing them away basically out of society and not just out of society, but into another yeah. incredibly harmful, traumatic, violent society at the hands of the state where people are making a ton of money off of, you know, their exploitation and the violence perpetrated against them. Right. And just, you know, another thing to keep in mind throughout this discussion is that, you know, like Julia said, like this isn't, you know, like the prison system is literally per the 13th Amendment um, slavery. You know, like the exception, the great exception of the 13th Amendment is that slavery is abolished except for as punishment for a crime. So just keep in mind this entire system, there, you know, per the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander, per, you know, um, I forget, I mean, Carol Anderson, you know, white rage, one vote, one person, one vote. You know, like there's a lot of literature out there that you can look into, but the world that Julia just described, you know, uh, cursorily is built on the foundation of slavery, exploitation. So, yeah. so, something to keep in mind, right? Like, it's not built with justice in mind, healing in mind. It's built to perpetuate the trauma that the people who are in that system have already experienced. I mean, it's, it's this huge collective trauma machine.
-hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that really stuck out from the film, and this is something that I think Kojo explained in uh, a different way when we talked about, um, maybe it was when we were talking about, um, uh, we were talking about George Jackson. Mm. I don't remember in which episode. Oh, Black Friday, Black August. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe this came up then when you were talking about this, and it was reiterated in this film in a bit of a different way. But it was talking, um, a, a woman in the film was talking about um, the power system and that how the laws are set by the state and that any, you know, like any law that's broken is then a crime against the state. Right, but the state doesn't actually care like what happens in that specific incident. They don't care about the person who's been, you know, victimized or hurt. They don't care about the offender. They just care that there's been a challenge against their laws. Right. And so I mean that totally like reframed for me again, like how I was thinking about um, folks who have been incarcerated, right? Because then like if somebody's challenging the laws and then you're coming down on them, right? You're deciding like who you're targeting with those laws, who you want to be incarcerating and who you want to be, you know, like enslaving if we're talking about incarceration as slavery. Right. And also like the, the victims aren't even considered in that process, right? Like they don't get to decide or have any input in terms of what they think is just or what would help them in that process, right? It's just totally run by the state. And, you know, so we were talking a little bit about that and then um, kind of more uh, in depth about you know like what you brought up at the end so maybe we should more, I mean I do have oh, okay. before we get there mm -hmm. um, just on this idea of laws um, I mean when you we were talking about this yesterday I was thinking about Atlas Shrugged because <laughs> there's uh, yes. yeah <laughs> Anne Rand and Noam Chomsky <laughs> can't get through a day without them yeah there's this line, there's this part, right? The main villains of Atlas Shrugged are essentially, I mean, summed up pretty well as like inept bureaucrats of the state <laughs> who, uh, anyway, that's the long story short. Um, but there's this more capable at, you know, exploiting, you know, more, one of the more capable parasites. He's having a discussion with uh, someone, some other character in the, in the story and, one of the things he mentions is that um, I, I th he's pretty much trying to negotiate with this guy who he needs to like keep the state functioning, <laughs> and the other guy, he's like, "I'll offer you this and this and this," and like the other guy's like, "That's against the law, isn't it? Your laws, you make the laws," and the guy's like, "Yes, but the laws are meant to be broken, right? Like, what do you think they're for?" And it was just one of those things that reminded, because, right, like, you know, and Rand's sense of socialism and communism and, you know, her villains is rooted in a socialist, communistic sense of Stalinist Russia, right? Um, that's just important to keep in mind when you're reading, you know, her stuff. And I just... <laughs> if just, ever. Yeah. Or, you know, like, if she comes up in discussion or whatever. But it was just that idea that, like, yeah, like that doesn't just apply in you know, like Stalinist Russia. Like that literally applies here. You know, like you look back, you know, the same episode we were talking about. You know, the black codes, Jim Crow laws, like all of these things, and you know, people who go out and defend the police and be like, oh yeah, they're upholding the law. Just a reminder that any time we think about what constitutes law, we have to operate from <laughs> right. Like yes, there are some laws that are rooted in like public safety right seatbelt laws that makes sense you know um don't murder people that makes sense but it would be it is ignorant to think of laws existing as solely for the protection of the people because there is a whole litany of laws like the two major categories that i just mentioned you know at the beginning of this segment and any other host of things that are literally, they literally exist for, you know, to give the police something to do, right? Other than protect and serve, mm -hmm. right? Like vagrancy laws, your people, it used to be legal to arrest, you know, black people who were relaxing outside in public, right? It used to be legal to arrest black people and punish who were reading, 
right? Like things like this. And these don't just obviously exist here, but they exist everywhere. But like, just keep in mind, like those laws still exist today. Laws that exist to be broken so that the police can crack down and, you know, continue their oppression. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole systems that we're describing today are very much rooted in the historical legacy of those laws. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And I'm also thinking, and you know, I mean, I need to think a lot more about this too, but um, even some of the laws for public safety, you know, mm -hmm. are meant to be broken or just disregarded, like sexual assault, rape, domestic violence, you know, when you think about a huge chunk of the domestic violence offenders, you know, wear badges, right? Like that <laughs> yeah. takes, you know, it has a different, uh, just has a little bit of a different spin to it. Or, and, and that's the, like, that's the other piece about the punitive system as it's working now. You know, like if I get raped, nobody's going to fucking come and ask me what I want to happen. I mean, nobody who has the power to make something happen. The people who are going to ask me that are going to be, you know, like the people in my life. The police officer is not going to ask. They might not even take my statement. They, you know, like, you know, they might not even do anything to find the person. Or, you know, if I'm particularly lucky, they might ask me what I'm wearing. <laughs> was I drinking? Where was I? Why didn't I say no? Why didn't I do X, Y, and Z? Right? Like that stuff happens. I mean, I've sat with people while well, it's been happening to them. So, um, and you know, just like. With that example, right, I can't help but think that, like, in that same situation, you know who they're going to, you know, like, first on the suspect list? Me. You know, heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. But, like, that's just, that's another one of those things, right? Because along with this concept of crime and, like, crime mm -hmm. lawbreaking serving, right, it's discretionary. So, yeah. Um, Unless we were married, perhaps, and then they'd be like, oh, marital rape, well... Right, <laughs> and there's mm. that whole context, yeah. But who could know Yeah. with, you know, race? So yeah. it could be complete, you know, I mean, it could go any which way. Yeah, there's just so many constructions and rules and, like, socially, you know, imposed um, pseudo-realities is what I would call them, around every law, right? Like... Yeah. Just, you know, again, like, law is not this objective thing. You're conditioned every day through, like, any number of sources to associate, like, certain laws with certain things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, like, yeah, in this one example, mm -hmm. like, there's so much. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And, like, petty theft is a crime, but, you know... Being a hedge fund billionaire and stealing money and like insider inside stock trading and whatever else, that's okay if you are, um, you know, leading a BLM protest or you're a water protector. All of a sudden, that's illegal. But if you're Trump and Giuliani and inciting, you know, an insurrection on the Capitol, that's okay, yeah. right? So like, I mean, we see it all the time. Um, the difference. Yeah, like... The hypocrisy of law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, who it's meant to protect mm -hmm. and that it's always meant to protect the state. And so any anything against the state, right, becomes a crime, uh, mostly depending on who's doing it. <sighs> and just one more thing. That, like... <laughs> This magnifies, right? Like, you know, I'm thinking, <laughs> Noam Chomsky. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just asked, yeah. like, 30 minutes ago, we're going to talk about Noam today? And he goes, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't know that's what you were asking. I thought you meant, like, something like, am I going to play Noam Chomsky? So, yeah, of course. I'm gonna, yeah. But, like, he, he's got something. You know, he's a linguist, um, most cited scholar of our, the 20th century. And, um, anyway, long story short, the dynamic that Julia just described plays out on the world stage as well, right? Like, just as the law serves to, <laughs> serves to serve the state domestically, right? Like, it doesn't serve the people. It serves the government, right? International law exists to serve the interests of the United States government, right? A lot of people think that as well. Oh, you know, we have the UN. We have, you know, the International Monetary Fund or, you know, the World Bank or, like the EU even, right? Like all of these different organizations that exist to, you know, kind of maintain some global order, really like that global order and, you know, this idea of democracy internationally is code for, 
if the United States says it, it's okay, then <laughs> it's okay. And if the United States says it's not okay, it's not okay. So it's just the macro reflecting, or rather the mac, yeah, the macro reflecting the micro. Like mm -hmm. the law here manifests the same way that we experience it as the countries of the world. Okay. I'm, I'm actually done. <laughs> I mean, no. Maybe for this piece, but now yeah. we're going to jump yeah. into this next piece. Yeah. So as we were having this discussion, um, I think one of, the, one of the things that feels like it comes up a lot around restorative justice, and I might be, you know, like way off base in saying this, but I think it's, it's held on to as a way um, of like, of resolving a lot of issues, right? And this like kind of golden standard way of doing that, at least among, at least for people who are not heavily involved in the movement and in the transformative justice movement or who aren't scholars in those movements, right? Like I'm not talking about those people who are like, you know, experts and doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, with a lot of language around social movements, language is always changing, ideas are always shifting and changing. And so I think people sometimes grab on to some of those, you know, phrases or words or ideas um, and think that's going to be, you know, like the end all be all or like the best thing to implement. And that's what brings us to, right, this like huge gap um, in the restorative justice movement. The restorative justice piece comes after the arrest, right, after the incident or crime than after the arrest. And we know in that process, a lot already happens. Yeah. So do you wanna? I mean, after the, you know, like between the perpetration of the crime and the restorative justice implementation? No, I'm talking about before, before. I mean, your whole piece, like your whole gap in this process. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, so, right, like, the idea being restorative justice alone isn't enough to uh, solve the problems of criminal justice. Um, and, right, like, what does that mean? Um, I mean, yesterday I described it as, you know, like, with this parenting analogy. Um, so, right, you have two parents. <laughs> yeah, we're keeping it nuclear right now. Two parents, one child, and it doesn't even matter how many children, right? Actually, let's say a whole number of children. And one parent is essentially the bad cop, <laughs> you know, and they do all the punishment, you're right, they're the disciplinarian, they have a really quick trigger, trick, quick fuse, like any little thing you can do could get you in trouble if you're you know, like that child, right? Get you in trouble with that parent. So that parent is quick to um, accuse indict and then condemn right like fall through with it and then the other parent comes in they're like oh you know like uh you know you, you can come out of timeout now or like now that you're out of timeout we'll um actually i just won't do anything to get you in trouble right like that's kind of the attitude right as at least right now you know because another thing right as far as why this is important is right recidivism recidivism rates right and i think in particular with crimes where the perpetrator is the victim, right? Like drug abuse crimes, right? How many people get arrested over and over and over again for like drug abuse or for, you know, petty theft to fund like certain drug habits and stuff like that. And in that case, when the victim is the perpetrator, the perpetrator is the victim, um, the question of justice is that much more important. I'm not going to go like super into it, but uh, it's this... Right, there's this revolving door aspect where clearly justice isn't being done and I think it's just one of the more obvious ways, like, ways that it manifests. Mm -hmm. um, so, <sighs> okay. I mean, is the parent analogy, like, is that relevant right now? I mean, yeah. But, so it, so the, the bad cop, is, I mean, is actually the cop and the rest yeah. of the state, right? So that's yeah. the state, that's the you know, arrest situation, that's the, like, whatever happens from, uh, like, the, the incident until, you know, like, the restorative piece comes in, 
right? And then the second parent is the, you know, like restorative. Well, all right. So I'm going to, can I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, in the good cop, bad cop, the, right? The way I originally conceived it, right? The two parents, one of them isn't restorative yet, right? Like in the initial thing, right? Say, yeah, again, condemn, indict, right? Or indict, condemn, whatever. The one parent, the bad cop parent punishes for any little infraction. And then the other parent comes in and they don't really do anything to make that kid feel better. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, I understand you didn't mean to do this. Or like, uh, you know, I'm going to give you your space or I'm going to help you heal. They're the parent that just kind of like, all right, well, like you're not in trouble. Just, you know, stay out of trouble. Right. Think about like a probation officer or something. Right. Good cop in a sense. The restorative justice piece in this analogy comes in if the one parent decides to change their mind, right? And say, okay, like, I see that this kid has a lot of trauma from getting in trouble so much. And they have a lot of, um, I mean, there's just a lot of negative whatever building up. And, you know, it's uh, clearly weighing heavy on them in some way. So I'm going to do something about it. That's where the restorative piece comes in. And then, you know, like, part of the gap that we were addressing yesterday comes into you know like their approach to restorative justice right because there's the one approach that says okay um as the parent right like as good cop parent right restorative justice parent i can either step in you know every at the tail end of every time this kid gets in trouble or rather at the tail end of every time this other parent punishes this child or I can step in and also get this parent to change the way they're doing things, you know? So the, right, it, it becomes, um, it goes from good cop, bad cop to bad cop, uh, restorative cop, <laughs> parent. And anyway, just for the sake of not getting lost in the analogy, like Julia said, you know, like the bad cop here is the state, you know, is the police, is the courts, is, you know, like the prosecutors, is everyone who, you know, contributes to the punishment, right? That punitive approach to law and order, right? To justice. And then, then there's restoration, right? And the, one of the gaps, right? Pitfalls of restoration is people getting into it and thinking that that's enough to address the entire system. Like there was a woman yesterday, you know, there was a, an example given, I forget what the example was, but at some point this woman was like, oh, but who's gonna hold people accountable for, you know, like uh, drinking and driving? Like, don't we need cops to do that? And, you know, like the, the thing there is, you know, like there's a certain mentality there that, oh, uh, you know, like <laughs> what we're doing as far as this restorative stuff is enough. We can keep allowing the police and the courts to do whatever they're doing. We just need to take care of this on uh, this end. But like, you know, the fact of the matter is the actual, you know, like healing is systemic, right? The healing isn't enough, right? Like a doctor, right? You, if you see someone coming in with a stab patient, a uh, stab wound all the time, like you can keep healing them, but that's not going to make their life better. You know, like what makes their life better is if you take care of the thing that's doing the stabbing as well, <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, I mean, the gap is the prevention piece, right? And especially right. with what we know about statistics and who's most likely to get in trouble and where, you know, police presence is highest, not necessarily crime rate, but where police presence is highest, right? And who's going to be, who is most at risk of uh, violence and trauma from the state, right? right? Because um, the restorative justice piece does not address that. It addresses the incident, and there's some attempt at some mediation between the offender and the victim, right? Like, and understanding everybody in the process is a victim and somebody who needs healing, right? But there's there's still that that like offender victim piece, and I think that's one of the major differences between restorative justice and transformative justice. It's not viewed in that same capacity. It's viewed as like a community a community concern and a community issue. And so the restorative justice piece comes in at the tail end, right, of all of the trauma that was just inflicted by the police. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the um, clips in the film that was shown, 
was a, and I mean, this has been all over media at some point, I don't remember when, but was a high school girl getting ripped out of her, uh, a black high school girl getting ripped out of her desk chair by a police officer in, I mean, in the middle of school, right? The restorative justice piece isn't going to be addressing that trauma that she just experienced getting ripped out of her chair by the police officer. It's addressing whatever it was that the police officer felt the need to rip her out of the chair for. And so there's just, there's a lot that's missing in that process. And I have no doubt that the people who are doing the healing restorative work are addressing all of those different pieces when they're doing it in groups and, and doing you know some of the group work that's not directly related to that incident and finding some sort of mediation. Like, I believe that that's happening. And you know, it's, it's a little bit like therapy and prevention work, right? And you know, you do the therapy after the fact and then you have all of this undoing to do and all of this like healing and trauma work and re-narrating and just all of this like processing to do versus doing prevention work, which I mean, the United States sucks at in general. It's just not, you know, it's not lucrative to do prevention work. Like it, it isn't for the big businesses, you know, it saves money in the long run, but nobody gives a shit about that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it, we're not, restorative justice doesn't address uh, the racism in, in policing really is what it is. The racism in policing and housing and, you know, like in, in jobs and food availability, um, you know, all of the, all of the leading, the things that lead up to people having traumatic life experiences and adverse childhood experiences, which we all know leads uh, those are indicators for crime, right? Then there's, you add in the policing to that. And then we get to this incident that we will then do the restorative justice piece for, but that doesn't address everything then that might get them, the person to a place where they have access to, you know, some of the like therapy work after, and it might keep them out of the prison system. Um, but it's not a, it's not a system wide solution, and it certainly isn't used enough because the criminal legal system won't allow it to be used um, enough. And so without that, you know, I mean, they're still like beholden to uh, the unjust system. Yeah, status quo institutions, talking about funding. I mean, so. You know, I guess, like, if I can ask you a question, what do you think, um, right, because restorative justice and its little niche that it has now is an important niche. Mm -hmm. um, so short of um, broadening the scope to a more transformative approach, what kind of resources do you think would be most available to expand the reach of restorative justice programs in the country mm. like what kind of communities um, what kind of funding uh, like would a mutual aid how would a mutual aid approach um, to restorative justice look things like that yeah huh I mean uh, well, yeah, I mean, funding's necessary, and I also feel like, and not that people should have to be, should have to do this work for free, I also feel like there's enough people out there who would do, like, that mediation work for free or for pretty low cost. So, you know, I think the funding might come in in some different aspects in terms of getting people into different life situations or getting the, like, financial support that people would need to be stable. Um I mean, I also think about, you know, electing local local officials who are open to diversion programs um, and mediation programs uh, for certain classes of, you know, crime. And I, I mean, it would be nice if it was for all classes of crime, but uh, that feels pretty far away. 
Um, so I think, you know, that would be important. I, I mean, I don't know if you're asking about prevention too, but there's like a million things around that that would be helpful, yeah. but that's not quite in the <laughs> scope, I think, of restorative justice. Right. Um, I also think, you know, like, I was going to say training, and, and I don't mean, you know, like, DEI training. I mean, like, the idea that this stuff actually works. DEI? Diversity, equity, and inclusion oh, training. Yeah, okay. You know, like, we don't, you know, a task force, right? That's what uh, university systems do. Anyways, um, like, actually, like, you know, how do, how to do the process, how to, like, some awareness about the programs that are there and available, right? Like, to know how to divert for people to even be aware that it's an option because I bet that's unfortunately a thing, right? When you don't want people to use something that's been established and is there, you just don't tell them about it. So I think, you know, opening people's eyes that this system works um, and benefits the community is important. I think uh, financial information about how it is financially beneficial to the people who care about that is important too, especially in comparison uh, to prison systems. So that'd be the taxpayers, obviously, because the prison industrial complex is there to make money. But when taxpayers are paying a bajillion dollars to keep people in jail forever, you know, I mean, that costs a shit ton of money yeah. versus, you know, like going through this process um there i mean there were stats about it in the film and it's just less expensive um and just to reiterate right like the taxpayers are paying to keep people in jail but like you know every day that these people spend in jail or prison the uh right like especially as far as for-profit prisons are concerned they get paid for that stuff right so like you're paying to keep people in prison who are then paying for people to be to profit i mean who then right like pr companies profit off of it's it's just it's how you know another example of how public money flows into the private sector without you even noticing you know mm -hmm. if a company gets paid for every day someone's in prison or in jail and our tax dollars are paying for people to go to jail <laughs> right that's public to private mm -hmm. I have, I mean, and feel free to like keep going on along your current trade of thought, mm -hmm. but you know, another question for you as far as the restorative justice framework and like, um, cause again, like, yes, we definitely need to expand the, um, the horizon of restorative justice, just like with everything, right? Not just restorative justice, but the horizon of everything needs to be expanded to account for systemic changes, right? Like no sector, isolated silo of the criminal justice system is going to change the whole system, right? Like everything working in tandem is needed to change the whole system. So again, like with this uh, parent analogy, you know, translating to the um, restorative, the sincerity of the restorative justice approach, what kind of qualities do you think are necessary for people to have? And by qualities, I mean like um, knowledge, experience, um, things like that, to sincerely perform uh, or engage with restorative justice, right? Like instead of being that parent who is just like, oh, I'm gonna be the good parent that doesn't punish like this other person does, be what does it take to be the parent who says okay i'm going to you know shift my approach to make this uh child's life better and include in that approach dealing with this other parent who continues to punish them for like you know every little thing mm -hmm. as the primary mode of engaging with them mm -hmm. um well i mean i don't know if this is so much like what somebody needs to know, but I think it's, you know, having a, an interconnected understanding of human nature feels particularly important for that, that we're responsible for each other and, and each other's circumstances in different capacities, I think, depending on 
uh, you know, our specific, I mean, I think depending on identities, our, uh, like, you know, social locations in the world, but if there's an understanding that I'm connected to this other person, right, then I don't want them to suffer. Like, then I know that if this person is doing well and thriving, then that is good for the community and it's good for me. Can I ask why? I mean, like, what does it mean to be responsible for some, right? Like, if I don't know Jack, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, what does it mean for me to share responsibility in their well-being or to, like, benefit or, right? Like, if they're doing well, how do I know that I benefit? And how does that benefit me? And if they're doing poorly, how does that benefit me? Mm-hmm. I mean, how does that harm me? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, like, I think that a lot of the idea of keeping people down is based on, like, there's, like, the scarcity idea, right? That there's only so much room at the top, and, like, we're all so programmed and conditioned to get to the top um, that we step on other people. And when we do that, I mean, uh, that's just such a big question, and... I don't know if I have, I don't, I don't think I can eloquently answer it, but the idea that it's okay for so many people in the world to be suffering as long as I'm doing well, I mean, that's a really fucking lonely place to be on top of also being like incredibly selfish and ridiculous. But, um, so I guess I just imagine, you know, like when other people are doing well and we can see other people through to their potential, like, we don't know what people are capable of, right? I mean, that could be, that person could have amazing things to offer the world, and we would all be better off knowing that and giving that person the opportunity to do that, even if the things that come out aren't, like, amazing, right? Like, people don't have to do something special to be worthy. So, like, even in part of your question, like, it's a strange question, I feel like, to be asked, because I think it's one that's, often asked because people are asked to prove that idea which comes I think in some ways from like a pretty and I this is not your mindset I know that but it comes from a really like fucked up capitalistic like hate driven mindset from my perspective like why am I better off if someone else is doing well because they're doing well like why wouldn't I be better off And, like, if other people are hurting, like, why wouldn't that impact me? You know, like, to see other people suffering. I mean, that could be me if I lose my job. Like, that could be me if, like, I have a healthcare emergency in this country. You know, like, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think it gets into more complex layers, too, when I think about, like, history and oppression and... Uh, you know, acknowledging and sorting some of those different pieces out too. Right. But I think the question that should be asked is like, like, why is it okay with you? Like, why is it okay with you if somebody else is suffering, if somebody else is experiencing trauma every day of their lives because of things that you're perpetuating? Yeah. Like, why is that okay with you? And why isn't it okay with you that other people are succeeding (laughs) and thriving and like in living, you know, like and have enough to eat and have a home and like don't experience trauma every day of their lives. Um, Yeah. Especially if there's something you can do about it. Right. And not like with that last example, but like, you know, if someone else is suffering somewhere else in the world, right? Like if you can do something about it, (laughs) why shouldn't you care, right? Like, why shouldn't you, anyway, you know, it's like, what's our relationship to the suffering of others? I think, you know, like, for sure, it is a loaded question, right? Like this question of what do we, um, like, why? Why is it our responsibility to look out for strangers, people we don't know? And, you know, it's a question that I've been asking myself, not a whole lot, because I think I have a pretty good, answer but like you know and rand obviously is like (laughs) you know 
that objectivism is very it's it's rational selfishness right enlightened selfishness is how she conceives of it um and like there's an argument there but i think i mean that was written at a different time and things have changed a lot and at the very least like the interconnectedness like you said of things has is one of those things that's changed like we are a lot more connected than we have ever been you know in history as a global population so like you know like why you know like just within arm's reach right like anyway i'm not you know like we have a, this phone that we're recording on right people from literally all over the world mined the the minerals right to like produce the technology in this phone and then manufactured this phone and like you know another part of the world and then like someone shipped it here it's someone's like many people for it to get here and then like the distribution and like the ip that went into it and all these things my and, friend who gave it to me right right so like <laughs> there's yeah i mean it's it's no longer just a question of um right like this is mine or like i am me you know like mm -hmm. i can exist on um like yeah we can exist on our own but if, you know, like we go out into the middle of the woods and decide never to see another person again, but we continue to use all these things, right? We continue to produce trash and then it depends on like what we do with our trash and how that's affecting other people. It's very hard to actually, you know, live a life that isn't connected in some way to improving or harming, worsening the conditions of someone else. So it's mm -hmm. just, you know, I think that's a question for y'all to like, ruminate on as well is why like what is our connection to other people because that's really at the core of like all this stuff like you know for all the reasons we mentioned before regarding laws regarding transforming the system regarding restoring justice like the major block in the momentum to like achieve these things because like you said you know like it doesn't take a whole bunch of funding you know ideally like if people just got with it and they were like hey i'm going to join this organization or like engage in this project or look into like the practices of reintegrating, you know, criminals in my community, like ex felons, ex cons into society, like look into what programs exist or how that's being done in my community. Then like all this stuff would be, um, I mean, we'd have the, uh, the capacity to like execute massive change overnight, but there is a blockage between people's ability to, you know, understand uh something i'm not gonna go into it but yeah i mean mm -hmm. it's systemic that's a if you take the systemic view again to like you know julia's point um depending on what part of the system we're looking at and how we understand that system to affect us it could be us right like there's it's so impersonal the way people get swept into so many of these machines, right? The criminal justice machine, the, uh, you know, like the sexism machine, the racism machine, like all the machines, right? People get swept in, spit out, and it's really impersonal because on the personal level, we're like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like that person was this, this, this to me, and that really sucks. But then you zoom out and you see, oh, okay, what were the odds that that person was going to be, you know, this, this, this at some point? And it's like this really cold machine is manufacturing people who fulfill this 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 harmful requirement to turn into this 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 harmful agent of society you know so mm -hmm. it's really yeah i mean it could be us at any stage of you know anything yeah and i would encourage you know like i mean that your original question was also like what kind of knowledge do people need to have and i would encourage people to do some you know digging research reading about trauma and the impact of trauma even if you're somebody who's experienced trauma before um and i say that not in a way that like you wouldn't understand it but your experience isn't the only experience right and so like also trying to understand that trauma manifests differently um and we know that uh I mean, this country is just intergenerational trauma is significant and this country basically like survives um, on causing pain.
to people. And so understanding then uh, how trauma informs, you know, people's livelihoods every day and people's interactions with others, I just think is really, um, is really important, especially if you want to get involved in, um, in that work and trying to understand where people, um, other people's experiences and what might be happening for them. And that doesn't mean like it's an excuse, right? Like that's never, because uh, I think some people think that a lot. Um, it's never an excuse for somebody's behavior. But if you're doing this work, you also need to know that right, like there are reasons that people do things and understanding that at the root and the systemic rot uh, is important. It's necessary. Since you're closing, it hey, can be. Do you have more? I mean, I could always keep going, <laughs> but you know, um, for the sake of brevity, when I can help it, um, and I think that might be the show. Yeah. Tell your friends about this. Join an organization. What's the name of that? Um, like if people want to get involved in restorative mm -hmm. justice work. And the new Jim Crow. You can probably Google it. It's maybe, I can try and put a link to it. I don't exactly remember how I found out about it. You said it's called End the New Jim Crow. Yeah. E-N-D. End the New Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. um, boom. Yeah. Spread some love. Fuck the police. But like, you know, don't like, you know, have sex with police officers. <laughs> Shout out to Dips and Coils. Yeah, for the earrings. Yeah. And um, don't forget to like, subscribe, share this again with your friends. And uh, we'll see you next time. See ya. like that?